Well, good morning. My name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor here at Curtis Lake. Great to have everybody out this morning. It's good to be back. I was gone in case you missed me. I don't think you did, but uh, no, we were uh, in Romania, Moldova. It's great to be back in the English-speaking church service. You spend two weeks worshiping in Romanian and Russian. You have no idea what you're saying and singing. You're just hoping it's about God. So it's great to be back with everybody today. We had a great trip. You'll hear more about that during Global Outreach Week that's coming up, but uh, Welcome this morning. If you're our guest, so glad you're here. Uh, my agenda for you is that you just experience God if you're our guest today, that somehow in the midst of all the foolishness of who we are as human beings, you can experience God and His, uh, His presence in your life today. So the question of the day, right, as we kind of wrap up our series is, what's the story of your life? It's a good question. It's a question we all ask, right? Like, what's the story of my life? Some of you are looking in your program right now for the talk notes. You're sweating. There's no talk notes in there today, no fill-ins. You just have to listen. There's nothing to like doodle against. There's no hope that it's ever going to end. I know. So everybody can just take a nice breath today. What is the story of your life? Perhaps the story of your life is sitting next to you, your arm around him or her. Perhaps the story of your life is sitting on your lap. Perhaps the story of your life is in children's church or the nursery or Firefly Hollow or as Nicole said, my place, our room with kids with special needs and that great ministry. Perhaps the story of your life is an address, the dream home that you saved up and you bought, and it's somewhere outside of here. Maybe the story of your life is found at Kenny Bunk Savings Bank or Fidelity Mutual or some offshore account off the Cayman Islands. I don't know, maybe. What is the story of your life? Maybe the story of your life is found in your medicine cabinet at home, the medicine that you have to take every day for the disease that you're fighting. What is the story of your life? What's the story of my life? See, we've been asking that question as human beings for a very, 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 very long time. From the beginning of time, it's been a question that we've asked. We've asked it different ways. Most recently, if you think of generations, maybe if you're in here and you're part of the boomer generation, you ask this question by saying, what is success? If you're of my generation, Generation X, maybe you know the question is, what is truth? Maybe if you're of the millennial generation and you wear skinny jeans, not a fan myself, but you do whatever you want to rock, go for it. You ask the question, what is beautiful? Is it not skinny jeans? I can tell you that much. <laughs> How many of you like the skinny jeans? Just own it right now. Just, we love you. You, got, you rock the skinny jeans. I'm going to get some white skinny jeans is what I'm going to do just for you. <laughs> now, listen. Now, we all ask this question. We ask it unique, but we want to know the answer. But here's what I would contend this morning is that the question itself is very flawed. And as long as we ask that question, our lives are going to be filled with pain and hurt and frustration and anger. And some of you in here, that's all you've experienced over the last season of life is pain and frustration and anger and hurt and rage. It's because you've been asking this question, what's the point of my life? What's the point of it all? What's my story? My story's awful. My story's terrible. And, and the problem is the question because the problem assumes that the story is about you. And the question assumes that the story somehow has to do with your choices and what you want to get out of life and and as long as we think of our lives in that way, as long as we think of our lives as a quest to gain happiness, as a quest to gain peace, as a quest to gain joy, to gain money, to gain friendships, to raise children who love the Lord, to have a bank account that can offer security, no matter what good thing it might be, if we think that the story of our life is that at some point in time we will be disappointed and we'll be frustrated, because I would like to say that the Bible tells us something very different about the story of our lives, and it's fundamental to who we are, and it's fundamental to finding happiness and joy in this life. And the point of it is this. The point of talking about this question is because the Bible says that the story of our life, if we really want to know it, isn't found in us. The story of our life is found in someone else. The story of our life isn't found in our plans and our hopes and our dreams. It's found in his plans and his hopes and his dreams, not for your life, but for this planet and for this world. And so do we all have a story? We do. But when we can learn to take a shift and take that 
question and stop asking what's the point of my story, but we start asking how am I a part of his story? Boy, that's when life gets really amazing. Check out this story and see if you can hear where the shift took place. Hi, I'm Bill Brink. Uh, I'm a member of the Finance and Oversight team here at the Curtis Lake Church. I grew up in Massachusetts, but uh, I don't really consider myself from Massachusetts because I married a girl from Bangor, so I consider myself a half-breed to the state of Maine. Uh, when I was growing up, my mother was a, a woman of faith, and she, uh, she brought me to Sunday school all the time. But even with that, I found out that I really didn't know much about Jesus. Uh, I went to school at the University of Maine. I was in the biology program up there, so I had a real strong science background. and, and I really didn't see how science and the Bible fit. Like a lot of people think that the, the Bible and science just don't match up. So that was kind of that opinion because uh, a lot of things that we learned from science classes didn't seem to fit with what the people who taught about the Bible said. Uh, I eventually ended up in St. Louis uh, going to chiropractic school out there. And two dear friends of mine uh, invited me to go to a Bible study. Uh, their names were Les and Ben. And uh, they were just wonderful, wonderful people. and really young guys of faith, strong, strong faith. Uh, ben had been a Christian for, for years and years, and the thing that really attracted me to him was that he, um, he didn't just talk about Jesus, he kind of lived Jesus. Jesus was real to him, and someone who affected his everyday life and his everyday activities and everyday decisions. So these two guys invited us to go to Bible study, and uh, my wife Becky was out there in St. Louis with us, and we started to go to Bible studies and started to learn a little bit about Jesus and about the Bible. So as time went on, they, these two guys uh, started pressing us more and more about decisions to, to be made. They were asking me to make a life commitment to this guy Jesus that I didn't see, that I just had studied and read about but I actually had seen in their lives, which made it really, really valuable to me. And so it took me a long time to make that decision to, to say, yes, I think this is a guy that I will follow, that uh, he is a man that I can put my trust in. Uh, of course, Becky, by that time, had already made a decision. She said, I, I think I need to follow Jesus, and you do too. And I said, I don't think so, I'm gonna wait. When I finally made a decision, I said, yes, this is the, Jesus is the one I wanna follow. Uh, that day, they called four or five of their friends, and we went to a pool in St. Louis, and Becky and I got baptized out in St. Louis in the middle of the night, just because that's when we made the decision. It was, about, it was, it was like nine o'clock at night when we finally made the decision. And there was singing, and their baptism went on, and at that point, I can say that my life changed uh, at that point from the baptism. My view of the baptism is it's a critical turning point because before that, I could have some mental understanding about Jesus. I could have a, um, an agreement about who he was. But it wasn't until you plunk yourself under the water when you are buried with him in baptism that uh, things started to change for me. Several days after we were baptized, uh, these friends of ours came to us and said, you know, the, the marriage relationships, sex, if I may say that, is for married people and Becky and I were living together at the time. Uh, I don't tell her mother, I don't think her mother knows yet, so don't tell her mother if you hear this. So we were living together and they said, you know, that, that relationship is really saved for marriage. And we thought about it, Becky and I talked about it a lot, we thought about it and we said, you know what? We need, if we made this commitment and we had at that time, we are not gonna have married relationships until we're married. And for two months, Becky and I did not have sex until after we were married. We did not need, or I did not need, the water heater in my apartment because cold showers were the day, was what happened every day. So uh, we, we just made that commitment. And kind of in hindsight, I think that God has blessed our marriage because of that. I mean, we've got three great adult kids who are on track in their life, and I think God has blessed us for that. But, but that's not the reason we did it. We did it because of obligation and, and obedience to what God wanted us to do. I, I think I put myself in the category of Thomas that was a doubting Thomas, as he's been called. Um, he wasn't there when Jesus first came to the other disciples, and he said, unless I put my finger in the hole in his hand and my hand in his side that was pierced, I will not believe that he's been risen from the dead. Later on, uh, Thomas was there when Jesus came, and Jesus apparently was not annoyed by the question, was not um, afraid to, 
be questioned by Thomas, but he said, go ahead, put your finger in the hole of my hand and put your hand on my side and believe. And Thomas's response is also my response, my Lord and my God. At that point, I couldn't resist accepting him as my Lord and God and have been in that position ever since. My life uh, since then has been up and down. I like anybody's life, I think your married life, your work life is all up and down. There's goods and there's bads. But through that whole time, uh, I have held on to and my wife has held on to as my best friend and my best confidant with, uh, with Jesus to say that He is our Lord, He is our God, and our major decisions are made with Him in mind, are made through Him and with Him in consideration. I've had several people in my life who have been very, very influential, who have taught me, people who knew a lot more than I did about the Bible and about Jesus and have lived their faith stronger than I have. And hanging around with those people have really helped me to grow. And I would encourage anybody to, to read more, to get in small groups, to be around people who know more than you do and learn from them. Did you hear when the story changed? When the story went from a being about him to about God, it was baptism. You know, the reality is the Bible teaches that baptism is more than just this symbol. It's more than a sign. It's more than, you know, just a, a, a part of our journey, that it's very poignant. And it has deep, significant meaning. The Bible teaches that when we go under the water of baptisms, it's this moment where we die to our old self. The Bible says that we, we go under the water in our sinful nature. We die to that sinful nature, and we come out of the water alive in Christ. And what that, I think, means for us today is this idea that when we go under the water, one story ends. That story that's about us, that story that's about our choices, that story that sees our life through the lens of our experiences, that story that gets frustrated and angry and upset when life doesn't go our way, when sickness comes our way and we, we question it and, and it's that life that's self-centered and it's that life that's about me and it's that life that's about my happiness. And when we come out of the waters, our life is different. When we come out of the waters, our life is found in Christ, which means now everything is seen through His eyes. Now the questions are not, how do I become happy? How do I stay healthy? How do I live a long and prosperous life? I have to do that when I say prosperous for our Star Trek fans. The point changes. The story becomes, how does God use this for his glory? How does God use my sickness for his glory? How does God use my success for his glory? How does God use my pain, my trials for his glory? How does God use the, my wonderful marriage for his glory? How does God use my children for his glory? Because I no longer live for myself, but I live for Christ. And that's a huge difference. That's a huge problem for us in our world because we don't want to bend and bow to anyone. We want to be our own Lord and we want to be our own master. The Bible says that we, when we go under the waters of baptism, we come out, we are no longer slaves to sin, but we're slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can talk about Jesus. We like to talk about Jesus, good guy, prophet, maybe miracle worker, changed the course of human history. We can even talk about Jesus in the sense of Jesus the Christ or the Messiah, Jesus the one who the Jewish people thought they were looking for, who rejected. So we can talk about Jesus Christ. But when we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, it changes everything. It says, I'm no longer the one in charge of my life. My life isn't about me. My life is found inside of Christ, and he is my Lord and my God, as Bill said in his video. This next video is another great story of change and how God shifted, and the story became not about a person but about God. And listen for the word serve in this story and, and hear what it means to take that step and become a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, not simply just a follower. Check out this story. My name is Mike Froming, and my wife and I, Brenda, have been attending Curtis Lake for nearly 20 years. And currently, I volunteer in the kids' church department at Curtis Lake, and I have the best job because I get to hang out with fourth grade boys and girls. Well, I grew up in the church. I had a family that attended church regularly. Uh, we were Lutheran, uh, and basically, church was never mine. My relationship with God was never mine when I was growing up. I kind of just attended church and went because the parents made me, to, made me went through uh, catechism and CCD and all that fun stuff because I was meant to and had to and 
it wasn't really my relationship with God. So I always kind of I grew up in this selfish atmosphere where I, it was all about me and my wants and my needs. And all the way through high school and college, I kind of did my own thing and really was, was searching for something. And it was always felt like something was missing and that my life was just out of control and there was no purpose. Um, and really it took until 1995 where you know, God just kind of revealed himself to me and I realized that there was just this huge void that just wasn't being filled by anything. I tried the whole party thing. I tried, you know, getting the, a really high paying job. I had, you know, lots of friends that we hung out and watched, played football, watched football. We th thought sports was the answer. Uh, it was just always something missing. And I thought it was a good woman. And I thought if I could just find somebody I could share my life with and it just, everything fell apart. And I still remember Easter service, 1995. Um, God just kind of revealed himself to me in a powerful way. And I realized it, it was him that I was missing. And, he just totally transformed my life from that point on. Well, I mean, I, I think I had that aha moment where God kind of took control of my heart and it was more emotional than it was just a lifestyle and a life change. And, you know, it wasn't until baptism occurred and a year after that and, and really Brenda and I started really trying to serve the Lord and find uh, a way to, to give up things in our life and just be a servant to God and really allow him to, to take control of our lives. So I think it was that crisis of faith where God expected us to kind of live in a way that was honoring to him. And he really uh, blessed those times where we were willing to sacrifice and give of our lives for him. Yeah, relationships played a really big role in my walk with the Lord. I mean, my brother, uh, Tom, he actually found the Lord way before the Lord found him before me. And he was really spoke truth in my in my life and was always that person that, and still is that person that will kind of get in my face and and be that loving relationship that person that will just kind of let me know that you know maybe my life's a little out of control or and he just really spoke love he spoke Jesus into my heart and just really kind of showed me that there was a different way of life that you know God had a bigger plan for me and you know even way back to when I was in high school and college I had a grandmother who would just did the hokiest things. Boy, she just would always send me tracks and books and just little like love notes as a grandmother does and just, just a reminder that God was there and that, that Jesus loved me and still wanted a relationship with me. And you know, again, it was always in my head. I kind of knew who Jesus was, but it just never got in my heart. And those people just were always speaking truth into my life and just never let me forget who Jesus was. And, the fact that he wanted a relationship. So those two are really integral in my life. And of course today and now, uh, my wife, we have a fantastic relationship. So I don't know where I would be without my best friend. She's always that sounding board and doesn't let me get away with much of anything. <laughs> Baptism, we got baptized together in 1997 here at Curtis Lake Church. And we just felt though as though God was telling us that that was the next step, that he wanted us to proclaim our faith and really kind of give our lives completely to him and, and think of ways in our think of areas in our life that God has clearly kind of convicted us that we needed to make changes and and uh, kind of serve him and follow him. And baptism was really kind of the first step that I that first step where hey this is my faith and I'm proclaiming that I'm gonna live as a servant of Christ. Boy I can tell you there were two seminal events that I can really hold on to that that God took a hold of and really kind of challenged me to grow and, and become deeper in my relationship with him. And the first one was somebody came up to me, Jay Saunders came up to me and said, hey, you know, I think you need to be volunteering. Uh, and he was willing to kind of get in my face and say, I think you would be great with kids. Um, start volunteering. And, and just the idea that I gave of my time and, and efforts to volunteer with kids, uh, just really, I learned way more than I ever taught any kid. I mean, God just really revealed himself when I thought of other people first and being willing to give of my time and talents to serve other people and, and kind of point them to who Jesus was and pattern my life after that. Just volunteer, volunteering and serving was just a huge thing for me and still is. Uh, and then the other one, I just, maybe I'm a two by four kind of guy. I need to get smacked over the head sometimes, but really I can think of two particular moments in my life where it was just really a crisis, almost where as if I kind of lost control and I, I couldn't do it myself. And I almost had to, to step out in a leap of faith. I mean, I lost my job in 2003 and was unemployed for nine months. And it was just a really hard process where God was saying, you don't need a job. You don't need a career. You just need me. And just really kind of revealed himself in an amazing way. 
You know, I think my story is a true story of absolute redemption. I mean, I was lost and had no clue and really had no idea what the meaning of life was until God kind of captured my heart and, and continues to get, lead, and, uh, lead and guide me. I mean, I, I have no clue what my life is going to be in store next year, but it's kind of exciting to know that God has a plan and my story is a story of redemption and growth and development. Love what he said, that his story is the story of redemption. And what's so true about that is that is the entire story of God. The entire story of the Word of God is his redemption of this planet. From the moment of its creation to the moment of the fall, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and through Solomon, and David, through the prophets, it's the story of God desperately wanting to redeem humanity to call us back to himself. Back to a loving relationship where we discover and understand our purpose that's found in our relationship with Him. And we've done a great job of continually trying to build our Tower of Babels. We've done a great job of continually trying not to be the servant. And here's the reality. This thing called Christianity, this redemption of God, only works when we truly humble ourselves into a place of servanthood before the God of the universe. As long as we think that we can have all the answers, as long as we think that we can be in control, as long as we think that our lives are about us, as long as we are that egocentric, as long as we have that level of puffed up knowledge to think that it's about us, we will miss completely what God wants to do in us. Is it difficult? Absolutely, because we all are selfish and we all have Facebook accounts. And we have completed our Tower of Babel. It's now called Facebook, where we can connect with everyone and share our story with everyone. And everyone can see what we like and what we don't like. Everyone can see why we're angry and why we're happy and why we're sad and why the world is at fault here. But that still is a very ego-driven, selfish way of understanding the universe. See, the creator of it all is the Lord of heaven and earth. See, the creator of it all is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's not looking for friends. He's not looking to redeem people so that we could find our purpose. He's looking to redeem people so that he can show us his purpose, so that we could find our existence in him. This is what Paul says in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 11, verse 36 says, For everything comes from him and exists by his power, and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Now, I have scoured that verse in Scripture looking for my name in it somewhere. I can't seem to find it. I've looked for your name there. Everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for my glory, is intended for my happiness, is intended for my joy. That's not what it says. It says that you exist and I exist by his hand and for his glory. And when we can make that shift, oh man, does life get cool. When we can stop asking the question, what is my story? And we can start asking, what is my part in his story? We see everything different. Because as long as you and I think that this life is about our story, we're going to look for significance in the way we raise our children and the jobs that we have. We're going to look for significance in the stuff that we own, and they'll always disappoint us because they'll all fade away. But what will never fade away is the glory of our God who created you and created me and created this planet. In Him we live and move and have our being. It's in Him that we find our purpose. It's in Him that we find what we're desperately looking for. Jesus said it, and Rob mentioned it last week, that if we try to gain our lives, we will lose them. But if we lose our life in Him, we will gain our lives. See, that's the crazy thing is the byproduct of our life lived for His glory is all the things that we strive after, fulfillment and happiness and joy. So what does it mean to live for His glory? What does that look like? Well, Paul formerly known as Saul, had quite an interesting experience where his story shifted, and it was no longer about him and his prestige and his climb to the top of the Jewish ladder. And he tells that story, and that story is told in the New Testament a few times, but let me just read one account of it for you. It's pretty interesting. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion. He said, you know my story. 
You know how I violently persecuted God's church? I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. You know the life I was trying to live. You know the story I was trying to create for myself. But then he says this, but even before I was born, before I could even consider my story, God chose me. And God called me by his marvelous grace. And then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. You're all Gentiles for the most part in here. And Paul said, see, I had this story of my life that I was telling and I was writing, and then I experienced Jesus, and I realized that my story was a part of his story, that God had chose me, that God was writing this story, and then he revealed his son to me, and he talks about how that happened over the next few verses. And he, he's basically creating this argument that, hey, I've received from God this calling. God's story is what he put into my heart and into my life. And he, he says after a certain amount of time, he visited some places, and he said, and still the Christians in the churches in Judea didn't know me personally. After all this time, after about three and a half, four years of Paul learning who Jesus was, learning the gospel, experiencing the gospel, there were still all of these Christians in Judea that had no idea about Paul personally. They just knew his story. They didn't know him personally. They knew his story. And what, what had his story become? I love this. All who knew was that all, all they knew was what people were saying. And what were they saying? What story were they telling? That the one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. All they heard about was this story that went in one direction and now it's all about Jesus. It's all about the proclamation of the gospel. And here's, this is it right here. This is, this is what it looks like to live for his glory, okay? So Galatians chapter 1, verse 26, 24 Write it down, circle it. If you have your Bible, tear that page out, stick it in your pocket, eat it, get it inside of you, whatever you got to do, okay? Because this is probably the most practical thing you'll ever hear about living for the glory of God. And I didn't make it up. That's the beauty of it. It's right here in the Bible. Verse 1, chapter 1, verse 24 of Galatians says, And they praised God because of me. They praised God because of me. Do people praise God because of you? Do people say, thank God you're in my life? Or do they say, thank God you're leaving? But no, I'm just, they don't do that. See, that's the point. To live for God's glory means that people, when they interact with you and with me, they say, praise God for you. Now, they may not say those exact words, but it's that feeling, it's that point that, you know what, you've entered into their life and what you've done has caused them to recognize who God is and the greatness of our God and the greatness of our Creator. And by serving Him, you have served others. And people say, praise God for you. And you see, that's how God uses our hurts. That's how God uses our mistakes. That's how God finds glory in our sin. Because when we allow Him to redeem it, He uses it. It touches people's lives. Their lives are changed. They experience the fullness of God, and they praise God because of you. Now, that doesn't happen if the story's about you. That doesn't happen if you and I can't do what Bill said, put ourselves in a place where we obey and take on the obligation of being the servant to the Most High God. Our world would have us do the complete opposite. The world would have you say, you know what, you can do it on your own. You don't need to submit. You don't need, those are, those are old ideas. But the striving and the struggling that we experience in our world is because we're unwilling to submit to the greater story that God wants us to be a part of. We're going to have communion here in just a moment. And as we wrap up this series and as we receive the bread and the cup, we're going to remind you that everybody's invited to take the bread and the cup today. You don't have to go to this church. You don't have to have said some prayer, gone through a class, or you don't even have to understand fully who God is. You might not even feel like you're following Jesus, but let me tell you something. Jesus is following you, trying to reach you, and it's a great opportunity for you to experience him. So as they pass that down, you can grab the bread and the cup, but 
Here's the reality. Even Jesus himself, God in the flesh, didn't come to tell his own story. Jesus didn't come with his own agenda. Jesus didn't come saying, oh, well, no, here's the, here's the point in time where I get to tell my story, where it becomes about me. Now, Jesus said, I'm about my father's business. Jesus said, I can't do anything unless the father reveals it to me. I mean, I and the Father are one. See, he came in and he entered this huge story. Now, granted, he is a huge part of the story. He is the way of redemption. He's the way to the truth, the way to life. But he entered in and and his story was a part of this grander story that we're all a part of. And so as we receive communion this morning, I'm going to invite you to stand right now and we're going to begin handing down the trays and just pass them down and spread it out. And There's nothing... By the way, there's nothing like really sacred and holy about how we hand these out. So just pass them down. Don't, churches turn this into this sacred, weird moment. Like it's just going to be a little fumbling and serve one another. Let it be an act of love when you hold that tray for the other person and let's not get weirded out about it. And so as those trays go down, you grab the bread today, you, you grab the juice. The Bible says that these are reminders of what Jesus Christ did for every person, that he gave his life as a sacrifice once and for all so that we could be made right with God. But today as you hold the bread and the cup and as we sing this last song, think about whose glory Jesus lived for. He lived for the Father's. He died for the Father's glory. And God exalted him to the highest place. This question of what is the purpose of our lives, it's, it's one that we all ask and we're gonna ask But if we change the question a little bit and say, God, what purpose do you give my life? What purposes can you give me? Great things happen. There's this thing called the Westminster Catechism, which is like a old, 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 old Sunday school class. (laughs) And the Westminster Catechism takes people through a series of questions. The shorter catechism is well over a hundred questions long. And the idea is that you answer these questions and in answering the questions, you understand what it is that God wants you to believe because there are certain things that are not subjective truths, they're just truths. And so the the catechism, the Westminster Catechism is meant to answer questions to help us understand what we ought to believe based upon what the Bible teaches. And each question in the catechism is built off of the other question. So it asks a question, it gives an answer, and then it asks another question that comes out of the question before. Okay, so if you trace all the way back, the very first question ultimately is the question that everything else comes out of. The answer to question number one begins the snowball of all of these questions. The very first question in the Westminster Catechism is this. What is the chief end to man? It's a very old way of saying, what's the point of it all? Why do we exist? It's the, it's the way that they ask the question, what's the story about? The answer was very simple and it's backed up in scripture. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. If you and I will make that our chief end, everything else will work itself out. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. When we make first the glory of God, and the enjoyment of God, everything else will be added. And so hang on to the bread and the cup. We're going to sing this song. And I selfishly tell you, this right now is the anthem of my life. I love this song. I don't run very often. When I do run, I start my run with this song. Because it gives me energy. It gives me purpose. And I want to encourage you to let this song become your anthem today as you hold the bread and the cup. Hold on to these words. What is the purpose of man? Whose story are you living? And I'm going to tell you something right now, as sure as I'm standing here today, that as soon as we will change the story and say, my life is not my own. I've been bought with a price. I am a servant of the Most High God, and I will live to bring Him glory and to experience His pleasure. Everything will work itself out. And there is no trial you will ever face that you can't overcome. There is no joy that will ever overtake you and overwhelm you because you always have a proper perspective that you are second and God is number one. You'll be able to face the trials with the centrality of Christ that says, you know what? 
I'm not that special to avoid sickness and disease and problems. I'm just bought. I'm not that special. Bad things are going to happen to me, but that's not going to destroy. God will use those for his purposes because my life is not my own. It's not about me. It's about bringing glory to the creator of this world and the savior and redeemer of lives. Let's sing this song. And when we're done in just a moment, we'll take the bread and the cup together. Let's pray together. Lord, would you forgive us for making it about us and not you? And God, would you consume our hearts and would you consume our minds with your story and an obsession to be a part of it? Would you, God, release us of our insecurities that have to make it about us and our success? And would you replace that, God, with a security that comes from the power of your Holy Spirit that our lives can find their deepest meaning and their greatest joy in serving you, in bringing your glory and your love and your grace and your beauty into the lives around us. We thank you, God, for your grace and for the cross. We thank you for the restoration, the redemption of humanity that you're doing that we're simply a part of, God. So open up our hearts to all that you have for us. And God, may the motivation be to simply be in your presence. May the motivation be to experience your glory, to reflect your glory in our world, to be that light on a hill, God. And Lord, in the moments where our insecurity creeps in, in the moments where our fears and doubts creep in, catch us up. Pick us up. Hold us in your arms. Remind us that this is your story, that you have created us and you have allowed things to come into our lives that are a part of a greater story that serve your glory, even though they might bring us pain and bring us sorrow. And when you do that, God, may we just fall into your arms and experience that love. We thank you for it, Lord. God, we pause, we pray for those who this evening are making that decision to turn the page in their lives, to make their story your story now. Be with them, God. Encourage them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.